All right, so hi everybody. Um, who's registered to vote? All right, I like that, that's good. Who voted already? Very good, who plans to vote next week? Very good, who plans to vote the week after that? Excellent. <laughs> Don't let anyone tell you the election's any later than next Tuesday. It's only one week away. So um, one of the things that I would urge you to do when you think about the 2018 elections is to think about it not as a single election, but as three elections taking place concurrently. There's an election for control of the House. There's a separate election for control of the Senate. And then there's a third set of elections going on for control of state governments. Uh, not in every state, uh, but in most states uh, where there are gubernatorial races and uh, races for state legislative seats. And in many states, the entire state legislature is up at once, uh, which means control of the legislature is up at once. So that's a lot. And the, the results or the outcomes of each of these three races is, is going to be different. Uh, I'm not talking about who's going to win and who's going to lose, but I'm talking about the stakes of each election. So. Uh, if we look at the House election, we know Republicans control the House of Representatives. They currently have a 23-seat majority in the House of Representatives. And uh, the question, the big question, is whether Democrats will be able to pick up at least 23 seats. If they do, uh, then they will take control of the House. And the way the House is structured, the majority party uh, controls everything. They control the agenda. They control all the committees. They have a majority on all the committees. They have the chairs of all the committees. And maybe the single most important thing that's in play in this election, they have subpoena power. So if Democrats take back the House of Representatives, they will have the capacity to investigate or do what we call oversight into any number of things, starting with um, Russian interference into the election two years ago through some of uh, the uh, questionable business dealings that uh, Donald Trump and the Trump, or Trump Organization have been conducting uh, while he's been president uh, to various policy areas where oversight has been slack. So that's at stake in the House. In the Senate, uh, the stakes are different. Uh, largely, by and large, uh, control of the Senate uh, is going to determine control of judicial and executive appointments. So right now, Republicans hold a one-seat majority in the Senate, but they are the majority. Uh, and as a consequence, they are able to set the agenda. And as we just saw recently with the uh, nomination of uh, Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, we saw that Republicans were able to control uh, the um, the, the advice and consent process, they were able to control the hearings, the agenda in the hearings when, uh, when votes took place and the like. So that's up for grabs in the Senate. And then in the states, you're looking at a couple of things. Uh, you're looking at policy implications in the states that you're really not looking at uh, when you look on the federal level. Because on the state level, uh, it's po quite possible that uh, if you have one party control of a state, it's possible for that party to be able to move ahead and govern. It used to be the case that you didn't need one party control, but in a lot of places you do today because our politics is so polarized. Uh, and, and so who controls the governorship, uh, who controls the state legislature can matter, matter from the standpoint of who gets to make policy. The reason I say that's not really a factor at the federal level uh, is because if you have uh, the situation that you do right now and Republicans are returned to power, they are already able to make policy if they can agree among themselves. Um, if Democrats were to take back, say, one branch of Congress, then uh, they would not be able to actually move ahead uh, with a governing agenda because they wouldn't control the other branch. Or even if they control both branches, they won't have the White House. So from a policy-making perspective, the state races are more important. And the other thing that matters is gerrymandering. Because this cycle in play right now uh, is, for the most part, a four-year cycle. That means that most of the governors and legislators elected in this cycle next week will still be serving four years from now. And in 2020, there's going to be a census. And then following the census, we're going to redistrict all of the House seats and all of the state legislative seats across the country. In some states, that's done in a nonpartisan way. But in many seats, it's done by the legislature in conjunction with the governor. 
process. So it's a partisan process. In 2010, that process was controlled in a number of states by Republicans because 2010 was a wave election that Republicans won. So they were able to control the districting process in states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Florida, and that led to a map that has been advantageous to Republicans ever since. So who wins the state races is going to uh, matter when it comes to redistricting following the 2020 census. So who's gonna win? Well, let me make this easy for you. I'm not gonna answer that question. But what I am gonna do is I'm gonna give you a framework for thinking about that question. And over the past year, the big question for those of you who are political junkies and pay attention to this has been, will a blue wave develop? A blue wave, blue being democratic, wave being Democrats sweep through and roll through like a wave. We've seen wave elections. And in wave elections, typically, a lot of races can be close, but typically the party that has the energy wins a disproportionate number of them, hence a wave. In wave elections, political parties will win seats that they wouldn't win under ordinary circumstances. So the question of whether or not there's gonna be a blue wave is the analytical question that a lot of election watchers are asking about next week. So what's the evidence that a blue wave has developed? Well, let me share that with you because there is actually quite a lot of evidence. In a wave election, you expect to see unprecedented enthusiasm. Well, we have seen that. We've seen unprecedented enthusiasm among Democrats, and that's noteworthy because in midterm elections, people vote at a lower rate across the board. But groups that vote for Democrats tend to vote at a disproportionately lower rate in midterms. This gives Republicans an advantage. Uh, Republican voters tend to be older and wider than Democratic voters, and those groups vote more reliably. So in the midterm elections, when voting rates tend to be down, they tend to be down even more for Democrats. This year, we've seen indications that Democratic enthusiasm is up. Now I will say, we have seen lately that Republican enthusiasm is also up. And in the recent past wave elections, that has not been the case. In past wave elections, the party that won was typically much more enthusiastic than the party that didn't. That's what we saw in 2010, for instance, when we had the so-called Tea Party wave, the Republican wave, where Republicans did extremely well. Democrats tended to sit out that election. Now again, it was a midterm election, Democrats often sit out midterm elections. But we saw that, that imbalance. Uh, if you want to go back to 2000 and, uh, 2006, was a Democratic wave. That was a wave that was a midterm wave. And in that wave, Democrats were more enthusiastic than Republicans. That's what this election looked like until a couple of months ago. And then we started seeing Republican voters take more interest and come home. And now the enthusiasm gap is much narrower than it was for the better part of the year and it's narrower than it's been in previous wave elections. So hold that in your thoughts, because that's an important point. Otherwise, every other necessary precondition to a wave has been realized. We have seen off the charts candidate recruitment. Not every contest is, uh, is, is not every race is contested. Not every house race is contested. Uh, sometimes parties have a lot of trouble recruiting candidates. This year, not at all. We've seen candidate recruitments for Democrats off the charts, especially recruitment of women to run for office off the charts. And that's a necessary, albeit not sufficient, requirement for a wave election. We have seen outsized small dollar fundraising for Democrats. Democrats have outraised Republicans on the order of two to one. And these are small dollar contributions. And we know that if you're gonna give money, you're very likely gonna vote because uh, it, it, it's a higher cost to give money than to vote. So we've seen a lot of people engaged in, in giving money and on balance Democrats have outraised Republicans. We have seen a very clear and well-established pattern of Democrats overperforming in special elections and also in the elections, there actually were regular annual elections last year, there just weren't a lot of them. Uh, but if you look at, for instance, Virginia, Virginia and New Jersey 
elect their governor in odd-numbered years, so last year was an odd-numbered year, um, and we saw Democrats overperform in those elections. Uh, they overperformed in Virginia. They also overperformed across the country in down-ballot races, races you normally might not pay attention to, like mayoral races or county executive races, uh, winning in places where they typically didn't win. And again, the same pattern in special elections on average of 10 to 15 points over the comparable election in the previous cycle. That's a big swing towards Democrats, and it's been consistent. We have also seen a persistent and sizable lead for Democrats in what we call the generic House ballot. This is a fictional measure of what the total vote for the House of Representatives would be if we were voting nationwide. Like you add up all the people who are gonna vote Republican, add up all the people who are gonna vote for Democrats. The Democrats have maintained a persistent lead in that ballot. However, because so many districts are gerrymandered, they can win the generic ballot and still not take control of Congress. A wave has to develop that is large enough to propel them to control of Congress. And that's, that's, that's the question we have to ask. Is that happening? Well, we've seen the expansion of the House map as we've gotten closer to Election Day. That is to say, as we move towards the election next week, more House seats are in play for Democrats. Doesn't mean that they're going to win them, but it does mean that races that looked a few weeks ago or a few months ago like they were out of reach now appear to be competitive. That's consistent with what we see in a wave year, where as we get closer to the election, undecided voters begin to break in the direction of the wave. We've also seen a shrinking of this exceedingly difficult Senate map that Democrats are facing, whereby they have to defend a number of incumbents in red states, and they have very few opportunities to pick off uh, Republicans uh, in, in, uh, in, in Republican-held seats because there just aren't a lot of them uh, you know, up for election, and the ones that are up for election are in states that are very challenging for Democrats, states like Texas and Tennessee. So even though Republicans only hold a one-vote advantage in the Senate, it's very difficult for Democrats to figure out where are they going to pick up enough seats in order to take uh, majority control of the Senate. But that said, in a wave year, you would expect the number of vulnerable seats for the party that stands to benefit from the wave to shrink. And in fact, we've seen this over the course of the year. All things being equal, uh, a contest like the Senate race in this state, uh, Senator Casey is up for re-election. That's not, that's not really close. Uh, you could imagine in a year where uh, the political dynamic is different, uh, Senator Casey might be, uh, that seat might be in play. Uh, there's a seat in Ohio that's not in play. This is a state that President Trump won. He won uh, Michigan, but the Michigan Senate seat is not in play. Wisconsin, same thing. So you have a number of Democratic seats that could have been vulnerable that are not vulnerable. And other seats where there is vulnerability, seats in more deeply red states than those, where they're vulnerable but the incumbent has been holding a very narrow but persistent lead in states like Montana, Florida, very, very close. If a wave develops, you would expect most of those close races to go towards the Democrats. So again, we don't know if that will happen, but everything up until now is consistent with what we would see in a wave election. And we're seeing robust early voting figures. Now from what we can tell, Democrats are voting early and Republicans are voting early. People are voting. There is interest in this race. Well, we don't know what the early vote means, and I caution you not to read too much into the early vote other than the size of the early vote. You see a big early vote, it does predict a big vote overall. And a big vote overall is again a necessary condition for Democrats because Democrats typically don't turn out in midterm elections. So we do see that big vote emerging. But does that mean that there's going to be a wave? Well, I grew up by the beach. I'm, 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 I grew up on the south shore of Long Island. And so I've spent a lot of time at the water. And the one thing I know about waves is waves only make sense in relation to the shoreline. So I don't want to talk about waves. I want to talk about beaches. I said earlier that there are three different elections going on. House, Senate, states. The beaches for each of these elections look different to me. 
And I think the outcome of the election is going to depend ultimately on the size of the wave if it develops, but maybe more importantly, the contours of the beaches where the wave crashes. So if you look at the house beach, you want to, let's call it house beach, right? House beach is this very gradual beach, this very low-lying beach that just sort of extends out from the ocean a good, I don't know, 12 to 15 seats. There are a good 12 to 15 seats that Republicans hold that I think a wave is going to swallow up those seats. Enough to get Democrats about two-thirds of the way to where they need to be. And then it gets a lot more challenging because of the gerrymandering. You have these hills that are the product of gerrymandered districts, right? Where Republicans have created defenses for themselves, districts that under normal circumstances would be unreachable by a wave. If a wave builds to a large enough height to be able to overwhelm some of those hills, that's where Democrats go the rest of the way and take back the House. If you look at the number of hills, if you will, the number of available seats, it's fairly extensive. There are, depending on how you count them, about 100 seats in play. And most of those are being defended by Republicans. So Democrats need to get, you know, in addition to the 12 to 15 seats that they're going to almost likely get, maybe another eight or so. And they have a lot of places to go to pick up those seats. So the odds are good that Democrats will pick, back, pick up the House. But they're not certain. They're not certain. Depending on who you look at, there are different ways of assessing this. You, know, you look at poll aggregators. The odds are very good. 85% perhaps. Those are good odds. But, you know, they're not 100%. They're not 95%. But they're good. Now, it's also possible that a wave will develop that's so large that it breaches all of these gerrymandered districts. And then things get very interesting for Democrats because behind those hills are valleys. And the valleys were carved out when the gerrymandered maps were created. Basically, the way you gerrymander a map is you take voters who are going to be voters for the opposite party and you concentrate as many of them as possible in a couple of districts that they're going to win by super majorities. And then you distribute everyone else to create as many districts as you can that have just enough of your supporters in them to be able to be easy districts for your party to win in most years. But in order to do that, you have to create a whole bunch of districts where you know, maybe you have a partisan advantage of seven points, eight points. That's usually enough. But those are the districts sitting in the valleys behind these hills. If the Democratic wave is big enough, it's going to flood those valleys. And if that happens, Democrats could easily pick up 40, 50, even 60 or more seats. Because what will happen is they'll flood the gerrymander. That's possible. So we're looking at a range of possibilities in the House, from Democrats just falling short to Demo Democrats having a large majority in the House next year, where the middle possibility is that they take back control, but the wave isn't large enough to flood those other outlying seats. This is where we need to keep in mind the fact that there is going to be um, that, that there's going to be enthusiasm and turnout among Republicans as well. I think that poses a real challenge to Democrats in terms of how high the wave is going to be. I realize that I have talked way too long, and I want to turn this over to Camille. So let me just say very quickly that in the Senate map, because the Senate is so difficult for Democrats, think of the Senate beach as being a very tall cliff. And the wave is going to have to be enormous to be able to get over the top of that cliff. Look at the Texas Senate race. Beto O'Rourke, who is sort of the rock star of this cycle, has been trailing in the polls three points, four points, five points. But it's Texas. It's Texas. It's a very, very steep cliff. If he wins, that's a political earthquake, to mix my geological metaphors. And in the states, in the states you have a, a lot of uneven hills on the shore. Some states are going to be very easy for the tide to wash in and wash away Republicans. To keep your eye on the Midwest. The trade policies, the trade war that we're in, is, is really hurting Republicans in the Midwest. I think the, Mich the Michigan governorship is going to flip. I think there's a chance that Wisconsin could flip. Keep your eyes on Iowa. I think it could flip. 
Ohio is a very tight race. And if it is a wave election, I think these races are going to flip to the Democrats. Florida, I'm going to let Camille talk about that. Uh, Georgia, now we're talking about races where there's active voter suppression. Think of those as being very high hills to climb. Uh, and then there are other states where there are high hills to climb, not necessarily because there's voter suppression, but because there are states like South Dakota where Democrats just usually don't win. But they are in play. And the fact that they're in play is an indicator of the kind of climate we're in as we go into election day. So just to pick up where he left off, I think part of the reason why there's so much uncertainty is because of how we feel right now, right, in this particular electoral moment. And so it seems that emotions right now are running at an all-time high um, for coalitions underneath both parties. And so I study political psychology and racial and ethnic politics. And in particular, I study how we experience emotions as members of groups and what that means for how we feel about policies and how we decide to behave in the political arena. So I'm just going to focus on three-ish things briefly. The first thing I'm going to talk about um, are the emotions that I think are being felt quite, quite strongly right now among different groups. That's anger, anxiety, and fear. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about three elections to watch that I'm most interested in, and hopefully maybe you are too. Uh, that's the Georgia gubernatorial race, the Florida gubernatorial race, um, and the Texas Senate race. And then I'll talk about what I think is going to happen. I'm not making predictions, but these are just factors that might be shaping you know, the 2018 midterms. Um, and so what I'll be talking about in that portion is democratic progress, democratic losses, and a possible red tide. All right. Um, so political scientists first started studying emotions really concretely in 2000. It was a book called Affective, uh, Affective Intelligence and Political Judgment. And so what these scholars argued was that feeling precedes thinking. And so how we feel shapes how we process information and subsequently our political behavior. So ever since about 2000, political scientists and political psychologists have been interested in understanding these processes related to emotions in politics. And so what this research usually does to gauge emotions is it has this question that it asks. It says, has Barack Obama, Donald Trump, insert political candidate, because of something he's done or something he said ever made you feel proud, ashamed, angry, afraid, anxious? And so what I argue in my research is that these questions are interesting, but they're candidate-centric, right? They're asking about how a candidate makes you feel. And they're not talking about how we might feel as members of groups. And we know that groups matter in politics, whether they're racial, religious, sexual orientation, otherwise, we think that groups are important and they provide cues to us about how we should feel about policies and how we should behave in the political arena. And so only recently have political psych scholars started to talk about emotions from a group perspective and it's in the context of partisanship. And so they talk about affective polarization uh, and how your attitudes or your like or dislike for your party or members of other parties might constrain or stimulate your political behavior. So if you're a Republican, maybe you really hate Democrats and that's why you're out here you know, voting the way that you vote or feeling about policies the way that you feel and vice versa if you're a Democrat. Even still, even though they're talking about polarization and partisan groups, um, they're still not talking about all these other group identifications that we think have really important political relevance. And so I like to borrow research from psychology scholars that have been working on group emotions for years. And I think the theory that's most instructive here is called intergroup emotions theory. It's called IET. Um, and so IET argues uh, that emotional responses to groups and social events depend on how the self is categorized. So perhaps during the Brett Kavanaugh hearing, maybe your gender identity for women is very salient, or maybe it's very salient for men as well. And so based on whatever identification could be the most salient, you might have really important emotions that are going to shape how you talk to people, shape how you interact with people, structure um, your behavior. And so what these scholars argue is that these types of emotions might be experienced about an outgroup's character or circumstances relative to the in-group, or about the actions of the outgroup and its implications uh, for the end group. So to bring it to the college level, there was one study talking about intergroup emotions theory that asked college students, um, how do you feel about Muslims? As a college student, how do you feel about Muslims? 
the same group of students maybe two weeks later, as an American, how do you feel about Muslims? And so what they found was that when the categorization was changed, the feelings or emotions attached to people's ideas changed as well. So when categorized as Americans, college students were more likely to have negative attitudes towards Muslims. When categorized as college students, more positive attitudes um, towards Muslims. But the whole idea is how we're categorized, perhaps at different points in time, uh, has implications or how we identify or which identifications are made salient, um, has different implications for how we behave and interact with one another at any given time. So just to define anger, anger is defined as a belief that we or our friends have been unfairly slighted, which causes in us painful feelings or a desire or impulse for revenge. Um, and so Professor Antoine Banks from University of Maryland says that anger is experienced when a person has been threatened, and more importantly, when an individual is certain about who's responsible or blameworthy uh, for the offense. So if we blame someone for some kind of wrongdoing, it requires that we believe they could have acted differently, that they had control over the offending action. Um, and so the individual or maybe the group of people that we're blaming is the appraisal that grows out of the context of threat and frustration. So that's a lot of like political psychology or psych term for just saying if you're driving down the street and someone cuts you off in traffic, you get pissed. Why are you angry? Because you know who cut you off in traffic and there's all of these lanes around me that you could have decided to go in, but instead you wanted to cut me off, right? So we become angry because they did something to offend us we also become angry because we think that the action that they took could have been avoided, right? These are the reasons or this is kind of the process of what happens when you become angry. Um, so when we are angry, getting back to politics, uh, psychology research suggests that it brings about the following action tendencies. It produces a desire to regain control, to remove the obstruction, and if necessary, attack the source of injury. So what does this mean for the 2018 election? Uh, existing research in political psychology finds that anger is a mobilizing or a motivating emotion. When we're angry, we're more likely to engage in costly forms of political participation like voting, attending rallies, working for a campaign, donating money to candidates and causes. And I think we're seeing all of this in this particular election cycle. And I want to talk about a few groups that I think are angry. Women seem to be pissed, especially Caucasian women, right? Debates over abortion rights and sexual harassment, the Me Too movement, the Kavanaugh confirmation, uh, have left two voting groups of very important, especially white women in the balance. Uh, single women with children uh, and married suburban high education like white women. So if you remember the 2016 election, um, these are two coalitions that were supposed to go for Hillary Clinton. And so we saw just about 53% of high education white women voting for Trump, President Trump, and I'm not entirely sure that coalition is still together. And I think emotions are clearly playing some role here. But this remains to be seen. African Americans are angry. Black people are angry, uh, especially at police killing unarmed individuals of color. Uh, if you think about what happens in the aftermath of these events, the city of Ferguson where Michael Brown was killed, uh, for the first time in that city election following uh, his slaying, um, the six member city council is now 50% black, right? And it was like 90 plus percent white before. They had never had like half black representation in this city that's all, my, that's majority minority. And that's been something that's happening on these local levels that we're seeing. I think white liberals are angry. They're still feeling the sting from the 2016 election loss. Um, and now they're trying to quite possibly redeem themselves in the midterm election with high turnout rates. Uh, white men seem to be very angry as well, conservative white men, um, for a number of reasons that we saw that were, that were clearly played upon during the Kavanaugh like hearing um, and confirmation. We can talk more about that during the Q&A. And I think Latinos are angry as well as it pertains to immigration, but I'll talk more about this in my next part when we're thinking about fear and anxiety. So when we're talking about fear in particular, uh, it's a vital response to physical and emotional danger. If we didn't feel it, we couldn't protect ourselves from legitimate threats. And so Richard Lazarus, who is a famous psychologist, prefers the term fright to fear because it involves threats that are concrete and sudden. It's the danger of imminent physical harm. And anxiety differs because it's a mood state and it's something that's characterized by worry, apprehension, and more somatic symptoms. 
And so when you're trying to explain the distinction between fear and anxiety, even though people use them interchangeably, uh, Avril 1988 states, ask a person who is afraid what he fears, and generally he can tell you, ask him what he would like to do, and he can tell you that too. By contrast, the person who is suffering an anxiety attack cannot say what he or she is anxious about or what he or she wants to do. Um, so when you're also thinking about distinctions, you can think about the physical or the bodily responses that you might have after feeling both. Uh, so you might be afraid if someone like sticks a knife in your back versus like the dizziness and butterflies that might occur if you're about to make a difficult phone call or if you're about to board a plane, right? So just differences between uh, fear and anxiety. And what some of the literature has found when it pertains, as it pertains to fear and anxiety, there was a book called Anxious Politics. Uh, and they found that when people are more anxious, they're more likely to seek out information, right, to help kind of resolve their anxiety. But what ends up happening when you seek out information is you end up finding information that's like more threatening, more prone to make you anxious, right? So it doesn't necessarily solve the problem that you had um, in the first place. So what we know a lot about in political science is like anxiety and information seeking, but also anxiety in terms of like political behavior that it might drive people you know, to go and vote early, right? Because you might not know what's going to happen, fear as well. And so I think when we're talking about both fear and anxiety for this election cycle, we need to be thinking about this in terms of immigration, terrorism, religious persecution, um, fear among Republicans might be driving their behavior, right? This idea that if Democrats are elected, especially a majority in the House, they can do anything to Trump and they might put him out of office. Um, that might be driving their engagement. Uh, fear of the farmers, as Matt discussed. So thinking about how the, as this trade war is looming, like the real stakes of these people uh, who no longer are trading in places with China, and China has said, like, we'll just go somewhere else. You know, people in Georgia who are clearly agriculturally driven, pecans and peaches, that's where I'm from, um, thinking about what are they actually going to do in terms of the money. They don't have they don't have these options anymore, and so it's becoming a real issue. Um, anxiety and fear for Latinos as well might be driving political engagement. It's a nice little body of literature uh, that talks about Latino fear and anxiety and increased levels in turnout, especially in the state of California. Um, so a couple of elections to watch, Georgia, Florida, Tejas. As somebody who is from the South, uh, in the Georgia election, if you don't know, it's Stacey Abrams versus Brian Kemp. Both people have really long histories in Georgia uh, politics. Um, so Stacey Abrams was in the House of Representatives from 2011 to 2017. Um, and Brian Kemp has been in the Senate, I think in Georgia from 03 to 07. He's been the Secretary of State since 2010. So both really deep histories in the state. All polls have these candidates within one to two points of each other. What's really interesting about the Georgia election is that uh, in the Republican primaries, Brian Kemp was actually behind the current lieutenant governor in the state of Georgia, Casey Cagle. And so then Donald Trump comes down to the state of Georgia to uh, campaign on behalf of Brian Kemp. And like two weeks later, Brian Kemp wins the Georgia Republican primary in a landslide, right? Um, which I think is really important when we're thinking about what could quite possibly happen with Stacey Abrams. Um, Stacey Abrams, if you don't know, is the first African-American uh, woman to run as a major gubernatorial candidate. Uh, coming from the state of Georgia. And so some of the things that have been going on in Georgia surround like voter suppression, right? And trying to keep people from the polls. And I can give you a number of examples of like turning buses around filled with elderly African-American people um, from the polls or exact match on voter registration cards. So how you uh, wrote your name or your address needs to exactly match, you know, all of your other documents. If not, you can get purged from the rolls. And all of these things are issues because Brian Kemp is the Secretary of State in Georgia, which means he oversees elections. And he has not resigned his position. And so people are up in arms about this. Like, is the election, um, is there going to be any kind of fraud in the election that's perpetrated, particularly by the Republican Party? So we'll see. I don't know. I was home a couple of weeks ago. And early voting is on par with uh, Barack Obama in 08 and 12. And so the ways in which I, I believe that Stacey Abrams won the election is that she gets Obama era levels of turnout. Um, and that's about it. There's really no other hope. And she appeals to you know white voters. And so her messaging as she's traveling around the state of Georgia is 
you know, don't vote for me because I'm a black woman, don't vote for me because I'm a woman, vote for me because I'm a better candidate, right? Um, and so I think that kind of messaging is appealing uh, to a lot of people, but I'm just not certain because it's Georgia. And I'll say more about that in a few seconds. Um, again, still think Kemp has a really good chance because it's Georgia, and it's Georgia, and it's Georgia. <laughs> um, no shade, but I mean, like, I grew up down the street from an active clan, right? And I'm I'm 32, and this clan is still active, you know, not too far from where I grew up. And right now, what's happening in the elections? People aren't just talking about voter suppression. Uh, it's an it's an old tactic of the Republican Party to talk about the Confederate flag and to rile up, you know, support in your base. Um, and so what's happened with that is they have this video of Stacey Abrams burning the old Georgia flag, which had a Confederate emblem on it, um, that's going around on campaign commercials now. And so the last time a Democrat was in office in the 90s, it was Roy Barnes. And so people thought he was on track to win versus Sonny Perdue, late 90s, uh, going on to the early 2000s. And so uh, at the last minute, Sonny Perdue says, if you vote for me, the Republican candidate, I'll bring back the Georgia flag. And so everybody's like, yeah, you know, let's go. You know, let's get out here and go make this happen. So literally two weeks before the election, landslide victory for Sonny Perdue when all of the other polls had Roy Barnes winning with the lead up. But just an idea of like the kind of fear and anxiety and anger you can stoke in the state of Georgia just by talking about the Confederate flag and quite possibly bringing it back. So I think that's something that they're trying to do now. And if it's successful, uh, which it very well could be, she'll, she might lose. Um, the gubernatorial race in Florida, it's Ron DeSantis versus Andrew Gillum. Uh, Gillum is the first black male to receive a major party nomination for the state of Florida. He's the current mayor of Tallahassee, gubernatorial nomination. The current mayor of Tallahassee, uh, DeSantis represents DeSantis. My boyfriend keeps telling me I'm saying that wrong because he's from Florida. Um, he represents the sixth congressional district. Uh, DeSantis is a diehard Trump supporter. If you haven't seen his campaign commercials, they're incredible. Um, he's reading like a baby book to his, his child talking about like build the wall and they have like little blocks, it's great. Um, so Gillum has run a really grassroots race. No one thought he was even going to win the Democratic primary. Um, and so he's using this really inclusive meta language to appeal to Democratic voters that I think other people should use. So the issue with the Democrats is that they have a very diverse coalition to keep intact. How do you appeal to black voters and white suburban moms? If you say Black Lives Matter, what if you have a white suburban woman who might not feel the same way, right? So how do you keep your group intact if you wanna also talk about LGBTQIA issues, but not offend the Latino Catholic that's also underneath you know, your purview and your umbrella of coalition? So um, this meta language that Gillum has found, I think is really useful talking about the economy, talking about healthcare, talking about being the only millionaire that's not in the race and he's working class like everyone else. Um, and every poll actually has him up about five to seven points over DeSantis from what I've seen and DeSantis. And the early voting uh, actually has him maybe just under DeSantis, like about by about a four point margin. So we'll see what happens there as well. Um, Andrew Gillum selected a white male to be his lieutenant governor. Ron DeSantis selected a Cuban woman. Right? So when you're thinking about coalitions that you might be bringing to the polls, maybe that's a coalition that quite possibly gets him a little bit more cachet than uh, what Andrew Gillum might have. I don't know. Um, and then the last thing, I'll skip this in the election. We can talk about Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz in the lead up. But here's what I think is going to end up happening. <laughs> here's, here, here are my predictions, and I wanna use that word just in case I'm wrong. Um, but based on emotions, and the things that we're seeing every day in the media. I'm inclined to believe that there will be democratic progress, but maybe perhaps not a blue wave, right? Uh, and so what I liken this to is the John Ossoff race versus Karen Handel in Georgia's sixth congressional district. This is the district that I grew up in. Uh, it has been solidly Republican since the late 60s, um, and that's not going to change over a year and a half, right? or over two years uh, of a Trump presidency. And so what happened in this election um, is that Karen Handel, I think, got like 51% of the vote. John Ossoff gets like 48, 49% of the vote in the district, which is a huge deal, right? Most times, Democrats don't even run in that district because they just know it's not gonna happen for them. But the idea that he could even garner 49% of a vote in a solidly Republican district that has been so since the 60s, that's progress, right? And so while, while it might not happen 
you know, in this particular election cycle, it's definitely something to raise your eyebrow at for the next election cycle or the election cycle after that. If you can get that much of the vote now, imagine what it might look like in a presidential year. And I also feel as though one thing that we're not talking about in mainstream media, not to go all Kanye West on y'all, um, but it's this idea of a red wave, right? This idea that there's a great deal of enthusiasm among Trump supporters and among Republicans, and that's going to fuel them to turn out to vote. So if it were any other president, and if you're thinking about what President Trump promised his voters, he's done everything but build a wall, right? So, and the economy is good, and his approval ratings among his supporters is high. If this were any other election, just about, I just pause when I say that because we're not talking about American, like American approval ratings, but in the party, you would reward that incumbent, or you would reward that party, right? And so I feel like no one is really talking about this uh, across a number of media outlets, this idea that there's a great deal of Republican excitement and enthusiasm, um, whereas in previous years, going off of the conditions that Matt said for a blue wave, there's usually a great deal of enthusiasm for whatever opposing party there is, and like not so much for the other one, which is why we see this wave. But there's a lot of enthusiasm for the Republican Party. And so one of the things that we need to consider is all of the individuals that could quite possibly, you know, turn out that are Republican. It's, it's not as far-fetched as people think. So I was talking to my cousin last night and he said, well, I think that, you know, a Republican, I, I said, so if a Republican wins in, in Texas, Georgia, and Florida, that would mean that Beto O'Rourke would lose, Stacey Abrams would lose, Andrew Gillum would lose. What would that mean to you? What would the takeaway be for you? And he'd be like, well, I just think that'd be sad. I'm like, why? Because these are historically Republican states, right? The governorship, the gubernatorial elections, the governor, whatever you want to call it, the seat of the governor in Georgia and Florida has been reliably Republican for the last 20 years. Do you think that's going to change in one election cycle? Could it? Maybe. But I don't think any statistician would like hang their hat if we're thinking about trends. Um, so those are just my thoughts.